It's wonderful to be here. Our scripture reading for my sermon comes out of the book of James. And um, I'm going to ask you if you would like to follow along in your pew Bible or in the Bible that you brought, because I'm going to really be going through that text. And um, James says this, James chapter 5, 13 to 18. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of the faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. So therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it didn't rain on the earth. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. Thanks be to God for that word. Um, It is good to be with you this morning. I did wake up. Claire, I got up this morning so you didn't have to preach. This was hard, though, for me. Man, oh man, it came early. Um, So I'm glad that you are here. Um, Welcome to Worship uh, Church. It's good to be together with you. Um, I asked James, uh, when he asked me to preach, what he'd like me to preach on. And he said, well, uh, prayer. And I said, okay, do you want me to do the next thing in the Lord's Prayer? And he said, not necessarily, do your own thing. I said, all right. So I'm doing my own thing. I'm still staying with the theme, but I'm moving to this really tough text in James. And um, let's wrestle with this a little bit. Now, I always like to start by waking you up a little bit. So here's a, a little fun story. So there was a man and a woman that just got sick and tired of all, and a few of you have heard this, but um, got sick and tired of the winter. And up north, and it's cold and nasty, and they just were sick of it. They decided to take a quick weekend trip to Florida. The problem is they couldn't go at the same time. Their schedules were different. So he flies down a a day ahead. She's going to join him the next day. He gets there, and he decides, oh, it's awesome. I'm going to send a quick email to my wife. So he sits down and types it out, just a quick little three-liner, and um, the problem is he forgot her email address and didn't do it exactly right. He ends up sending this email to an elderly widow woman, preacher's wife in Iowa, and when she opens it up, she is so excited because she had just buried her husband a couple of days earlier. Um, She's grieving, and she gets this email thinking it's from her husband, and so she's sort of happy that she gets one last message kind of from him, and she's reading through this, and she about falls off her chair in a gasp, and she's shocked, and her kids come running in. What is wrong? And they look at the text, and it says this, Dearest love, I made it safe and sound eagerly awaiting for your arrival tomorrow. (laughs) P.S. It sure is hot down here. So I guess communicate, I don't know how to do that with my sermon. I think think it's about communication, so we've got to be careful with our communication. So so there you go, okay. Um, uh, Yesterday the basketball team went and played their state tournament game. How'd they do? Lost by one. Oh man. They lost by one. Um, Before the game, just like with all the soccer matches that I coached, uh, they played the national anthem. And um, so before the game starts, before you go to a ball game, the Indians or a football game, the Browns, any game you go to, they typically play the national anthem. Now, the national anthem has absolutely nothing to do with the game, right? Doesn't add any you know, balls or runs to the bottom score line. It doesn't encourage with coaching tips any player so they get a little better. It doesn't lean towards one team or another. What is the point of the national anthem? It has nothing to do with the game or the event. It has to do with just a tradition. It has to do with honoring the flag. It has to do with honoring our nation. And so we sing the national anthem before every game. I feel like prayer is often, even my prayer is often like that. It's sort of disconnected to what's really going on in my life. 
It's something I do that's sometimes rote. It's just something I do that's sometimes tradition. Um, I'm supposed to do it. So I close my eyes and I say the words, and then I move on to whatever it is I'm dealing with. Um, it's like the national anthem at a sporting event. I want us to take a look, and maybe I want to try to encourage you in your prayer life today a little bit even more, even deeper. Um, so let's start with this. God's will, God has a will for your life. He has a will for what he plans on the planet. There's something that God is doing. He wants things to happen a certain way. It's, it's his will. But his will is both conditional and unconditional. God's will has a conditional will and an unconditional will. His unconditional will is that part of what he does, what he wants to do, that has absolutely no effect based on what you do or what I ask. It's what he's going to do. He is God. He's sovereign. He's the creator of the planet. Um, he is going to do this part of his will no matter what we ask or what we desire, right? That's his unconditional will. There's no condition that you and I could ask of him that would change anything. But there's a conditional will of God, and the conditional will of God is that part of God who uh, wants to do something for us, but the condition is we have to ask for it. There's something that he wants from us before he extends his will in our lives, okay? So an example of that would be in the scriptures, it says very, very clearly, God wants all people saved. He wants every man, every woman, every child on the planet saved, everyone. But there's a condition. It says we must ask. We must say with our lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, and then you shall be saved. So there's something you and I have to do. We have to say the prayer. We have to ask him into our lives. He does not automatically save everyone. There's a condition on his will. He wants us saved but he wants something from us in the process. And so that whole thing is really tough for me to sort out. So the will of God is difficult to figure out. It's not always easy to know what God's will is, why some prayers are answered, why some prayers are not answered. If it was your will for all of us to get healed, why is it that we don't all get healed? Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a tough thing to sort out the will of God. And yet, he asks us to pray. Paul says, pray continually. Don't stop praying. Keep your prayers directed towards heaven. And I think that's why. We don't necessarily know the mind of God. So, man, oh man, if you have a worry or a concern or a, a need in prayer, man, just beg God in your prayer life that that might happen. Um, okay, so the, the group from the church that went down to Belize, we had to get passports before we left. And uh, so I took, Marianne and I took our passports and it's an amazing thing, this silly little book. You show it to the right person and they literally let you into the country. And can't get back in the country unless you show your silly little book and then they let you get back in the country. So you have to have a passport, and then you are welcomed into the country. Prayer is like a passport. It's, it's, um, it's that piece of help that God gives to us to bust into heaven. It's a spiritual thing. It allows you to go from this earth, to th from this world, into the realm that's spiritual, into the realm of God. It, it allows you, prayer is your passport, it allows you to go to God, to the king of that world, country, how about there? It's, it allows you to go to the king of that country, God, and ask him for something to happen here in your country, in your land. Is that kind of making sense? So you go to this other place, you do your passport, you pray, and you ask God to do something in your life that, is, that you need to have happen in your life. So that's, to me, kind of what prayer is. It's going to God, going to heaven, asking God. It's the only time in your life that you really do that. Everything else that I do is here on this planet. 
all the people that I deal with is here on this planet, but God gives me an 800 number, he gives you an 800 number, a passport, to get to him. And folks, it's called prayer. And I've had so many people over the course of my time, my years, say, I, I just can't pray, I, I'm just tired, or God doesn't, I don't know if God hears it anyhow, will you pray for me? You know, and so prayer, I think, is a real thing that we need to kind of deal with and come to a better understanding of why it needs to happen. I want to encourage you in your prayer life. So Jesus is with his disciples. They all gather. There's a zillion people there. The Bible says 5,000 men, which means there may be upwards to 20,000 people with children and wives. And there, it's late in the day. He's been preaching all day. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? And he's preaching along, and the disciples say, Jesus, we got to stop. They're getting hungry. we got to let them go. He says, no, just feed them. And they said, well, no. And Jesus says, yeah, feed them. And he said, well, we don't have anything to feed them with. And Jesus says, what do you have then? So they go out, and they collect a couple of fish and, and five loaves from this little boy, and they bring it to him, and they said, this is it. And so what does Jesus do? Gets his passport out. He takes the stuff and he prays. And he invites heaven into the problem. And when they start passing it out, there's so much left over after God does this thing. Um, it's God's will for them to be fed. And even in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus gets down on his, I don't know, he tells the disciples to wait here. He's got to go in and pray just before they arrest him. And he gets, in my mind, he gets down. He just gets on his hands and knees and just begs God. He's in anguish. He invites heaven into his problem. And he says, I can't do this. This is so hard. Come in and help me. Take this, what he literally says, take this cup from me. He invites God into the problem. God's will that time was, no, you got to go through this. you got to be the sacrificial lamb. you got to do the whole thing. So let me get this straight. Jesus prays for the food for all the people, and it happens. Jesus prays to have the cross taken away from him. It doesn't happen. So if Jesus is turning his heart and his head to heaven repeatedly, several, three times in the garden. He didn't get an answer. Third time he finally got an answer. How much more do you and I need to pray? If Jesus needs to get his passport out and talk to God in heaven, how much more do you and I need to do the very same? And sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I give up. Or I don't, I don't know if I give up. I'll pray once or twice. Somebody will say, will you pray for me? I'll pray once or twice, and then I just sort of let it go. We're making a huge mistake to let prayer be that flippant. So let's get it, let's get it right. Prayer is, is breaking into another realm. It's going to heaven, okay? It's communicating with heaven, something earthly. Asking the author of heaven, to come into this realm and do something for us. That's prayer. Don't make a mistake. It's not magic. You're not asking for a magic trick. It's not something where you can convince or I can convince God to do something that he already hasn't set his mind to do. If you pray and you ask God to change his will, I can tell you probably what's the answer going to be. He's going to say, no, I, I've already got my plans set out for you. So you're, you're not changing God's mind. You're asking him to open up the realms of heaven to do something for you that he already has set in his heart to do for you. It's something already that he wants to help you with. Um, the, oh, the third thing was you're, you're not changing his mind. You're not asking God, you're not trying to, you're not a salesman, you're not trying to sell God on something so that he'll change it. So prayer doesn't change the mind of God, it's not magical, it doesn't convince God to do something he doesn't want to do. 
Prayer literally is reaching out from earth to heaven, asking the author to come into earth and do something for you that is already in his will to do for you. That's already something that he has designed, and you are begging him to do that for you. That's, that's what prayer is. God wants to hear from us. I love the passage in Isaiah 25. Um, Before you even asked, I answered. How awesome is that? So before you even asked, I already had it ready for you. I already knew what you were going to ask. I had the answer prepped up, ready to go. I just needed to hear from you. That's God's will being readied for us. James 4.2, just a chapter before. James says, oh man, you guys, um, you do not have, you don't have because you don't ask God. You didn't ask God, that's why you don't have. That's what James says. So it's almost like, I wanted to give it to you, God says, I wanted you to have it, but you never came to me and asked for it. So oftentimes I think prayer is kind of like that. Okay, so there's the foundation. So let's get to the scripture. So the scripture says, are any among you suffering? You should pray. In the NIV, it says, are any of you in trouble? You must pray. So, you know, we could ask that same question to this congregation. James looked at his congregation and he asked for hands. Are any of you suffering? And I'm sure a bunch of them raised their hands. And he said, you should pray. So suffering doesn't mean necessarily just physical it doesn't necessarily mean just sick we tend to take this passage and we talk about illness and hospital and stuff like that this is bigger than that this is trouble are any of you struggling in life are you having trouble in life is there problems in your marriage is there problems at work are there problems here and there are you struggling are you putting on a good face when you need to but man inside you're just filled with turmoil is that happening then you should pray In fact, it's almost more than that. You must pray. If you want God to intervene, you must pray. You better pray. So pain, um, trouble is always an invitation to God to hear from us. Did you guys get that? Did you hear that? I want you to hear that. If you have trouble, suffering, struggles in your life, that is an invitation for you to pray to God. Keep going. Are any of you among you, um, are any among you uh, suffering? Are any among you uh, cheerful? Then you should sing songs of praise. So if you're suffering, you pray. If you're cheerful, if things are good, if you, if you didn't raise your hand when James asked, and that means that you're not suffering, then you're doing the opposite. You're cheerful. Life is good. You're happy with what's going on. You see God's blessings in your life. How should you respond? Praise. Now, praying, it can be very quiet. That's kind of a quiet thing to do. That's an otherworldly thing to do. It's talking to God. It's breaking into his realm. Praise is loud. Praise shouldn't be quiet. It should be having Mike get down here and pound on the drums and get us going. Praise is, oh my goodness, you guys, Jesus did something, and and you got to hear this. That's praise. So praise and prayer, you're either doing prayer because you're suffering or you're doing praise. So no wonder Paul says it's got to be continual. It's got to be a lifestyle. It's almost like breathing. You need to be praying and praising almost like eating and breathing. It should just be a part of your life. It should be what you do. So are you suffering? Pray. Are you cheerful? Um, Man, rejoice, praise. So you're always doing one or the other. Verse 14, are any among you sick? Now he's breaking into another thing, and we sort of blend all this together, but the actual Greek word is astheneo. Are any of you astheneo? Better translation than sick is, are any of you weary? Are you worried? Is there stuff happening in your life that is just beating you down? Uh, A better word is um, worry and stuff. So it's kind of like Paul's asking, Are you just sick of life right now? Are you just sick and tired? Are you looking at the person next to you and going, I am sick of you? That's this word. I am sick of work. I am sick of my job. I'm sick of my kids. 
Oh, I never say that. I'm sick of, you know, whatever it is. That's this word. I just can't take it anymore. I'm done. In fact, I am so done. I'm so sick of it. I don't even have the energy to tell you about it, God. I don't even, I don't have, it's just beat me down. Before, if you're in trouble, you pray. But this is a different level. Now, I'm needing it so badly, I'm so beat down, I can't do anything about it. Then what does he say to do? Go to the elders of the church. Have the elders of the church pray for you. Wait a minute, I thought the elders of the church were just praying for me when I was in the hospital. That's not what this passage says. This passage says when you get to the point in your life that you are so worn out that your prayer is not effectual anymore, go to the elders of the church and have them pray over you. And what you will find is they will want to put oil on you. They will pray a fervent prayer because they're faithful people and they're going to offer maybe even oil for you because in Jesus' world, that was a big deal to anoint with oil and that added God's blessing, God's impact on people's lives. And so you pray over them, you do oil, you pray how? In the name of the Lord. So folks, when you're praying, always end. Always pray in Jesus' name. Why? Because you're in His realm. It's not your realm. It's His realm you're going into. And so you're praying this prayer. You're asking it in His name. I want this to be done for me. I need, I need you to bolster me. I'm tired. I'm weary. I can't do it anymore. God, in Your name, bolster me and strengthen me. And guess what? He'll do it. He will bolster you. It's awesome. Benaiah, um, my grandson, was very sick. They didn't know what to do. They, you guys all prayed for him. Uh, we thought it was literally leukemia. I didn't even want to say the word because of the blood tests. They sent the blood tests. They did three different blood tests. They sent him to Australia to have some blood specialist read the, the thing. The first test said, yes, leukemia. I got on my knees. I called Davy. I said, Davy, anoint him with oil. Pray over him. The second test they sent to Australia, oh, there was an improvement in his blood. There was an improvement in less in fewer cells. The third test, <coughs> the third test was sent to Australia. <coughs> clean. It came back clean. The prayers of the righteous, of the fervent prayers. Oh, guys, this is not, oh, whew, I'm hungry. Jesus, thank you for this food. Amen. Let's dive in and eat. That's a prayer that you say so often and so rote, you just do it because you want to get to the soup. It's just time to eat. So you, you got to do it. You got to get it out of the way. So you say it. Or, now I lay me down to sleep. Bless my Lord. My and I'm out. Those are prayers that are just, you do them. But I'm not saying don't do them, but that's different than this prayer. This is a prayer of a person who is in trouble. And so it's a different prayer. You, you just you bust down and you beg. You break into heaven and you beg God to intervene for you. He wants to hear from us like that. And he says, but if there is sin in your life, first pray for forgiveness. Oh, you mean sin can impact the answers to my prayer? Absolutely. If there is sin in your life, and who of us doesn't have it? Oh, no hands. Okay, I, we got it then. All of us have sin in our lives. So man, always pray first that God forgives whatever it is that's going on. If there's something happening in your life, righteousness means you've given it over to God and He's, at, and he's given you, granted you forgiveness. And the Scripture says He will answer then your prayer but I'm too weary. I don't even have the energy to go to God. My sin is so great. Maybe it's not sin. Maybe I'm just tired. It might be sin. If it is sin, it's going to impact your life. If it's not sin, life impacts your life. So it's one or the other, and I just can't do it anymore. I need some righteous people around me to pray for me, to bolster me up. 
This happened to me near the end of my retirement. I was just worn out, and I needed that. The clergy of Norwalk, got, they knew that. They heard that. I told them. And they surrounded me at one of our meetings. They literally took a half an hour of one of our Norwalk ministerial meetings, and they put me in the middle, and they said, Paul, we're praying for you. And they bolstered me through. They went to God because I just didn't have any more. And they perked me up, and they got me going. The righteous, the prayers of the faithful will save the sick. The Lord will raise them up. If anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to, oh, therefore, confess your sins to one another. I don't want to tell anybody my sins. Well, it doesn't say anybody. It says, confess your sins to one another so that they will pray for you. Folks, it's, it's not a billboard for everybody. Don't confess your sins to just anybody. Some of us confess sins to people that just want to tell other people. That's not what he's telling us to do. That's just a gossip person. Tell your sins to someone who will pray for you because you are too weary to do it yourself. So make sure that you are asking, am I saying it correctly? Make sure that you are confessing to someone who you trust is a righteous person and will carry that concern to God for you no matter what the sin is. Because God will forgive that. Don't let them get in the way of that. Make sure it's someone who will pray for you so, verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Hearing the sin isn't the goal. Healing the sin is the goal. Forgiving the sin is the goal. And then the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. So deal with the one, move on to the other. And it works. It absolutely works. Whew. Did I do it? Folks, be prayers. Don't allow yourself to be convinced that you, you don't have it in you. God wants to hear from you, especially in times of great need. Amen? Amen. Amen.